Hey there, and welcome to SI Now. It's Wednesday, October 19th, and I'm Ryan Aselta in today for Maggie Gray. We've got a nice mix on today's show. We're going to talk some NBA with the man who wrote this week's Sports Illustrated cover story on Russell Westbrook. That's Lee Jenkins. Plus, World Golf Hall of Famer Greg Norman stops by the studio. But we start on the diamond where the mighty Cubs lineup has gone quiet, leaving Chicago in a 2-1 hole in the NLCS. Our first guest was a three-time All-Star and the 1995 American League MVP with the Boston Red Sox. Mo Vaughn joins us and Mo, let's talk about this National League Championship Series. The Cubs offense struggling, hitting 161 in this series right now. You were in the postseason twice. First time didn't go so well for you. 95, you didn't have a hit. 98, you hit the heck out of the ball. 400, a couple home runs. Is there is there a mental hurdle that players have to get over in October baseball? It's just experience. Um, understanding that the game was different in the playoffs. The pitching is different in the playoffs. In the playoffs, pitchers are, are prone to get you out with as least pitches as possible. So 0-2, you're not getting very waste pitches. They're going right to your weaknesses. That's the difference. You got to be ready to hit early, and you got to be ready to hit with two strikes at all times because the game has changed. It's all sped up. I had the experience myself. I came off of you know Sox winning. You know, in 95, we went from, you know, last to first. I got to the playoffs. We clinched a little bit too early, I thought. Did, couldn't pick it back up. Before you know it, I was 0 for 14, and we were out of it in three games. So I understand where they are. They'll learn from this if they get a chance to. Cubs really struggling hitting lefties. You're obviously a lefty power hitter. You see a guy like Anthony Rizzo struggling. What's the approach got to be for a guy who's in a bit of a funk and facing a bunch of lefties coming up from the Dodgers? Well, me, I, I took the place. I, you know, I hit close to the plate. So I knew exactly where my inside pitch was going to be. To me, hitting is about forcing the pitcher to do certain things that you want them to do. If you give them too much area, then they can go right or left, and all of a sudden you're, you don't know which way to be. So for me, lefties is different than hitting righties. You have to have an approach. I think I had a pretty good approach doing it, and that's why it worked out. Listen, they got to they gotta get some hits. They got to try to get this thing going, or it could be over real quick. You knew what it was like to play for a fan base that was desperate for a championship. Obviously, you were prior to the Red Sox breaking their curse in 2004. How much pressure is there on these Cubs who are feeling a, a pressure of 108 years, a fan base who not only wants to win, they expect to win after the season that they had during the regular season? You know, best record in the league, clinch early. They have, the, you know, they have a great team put together. You know, uh, this is tough. It's, it's, I didn't realize the pressure until I left Boston. Um, I'm sure it's much easier to play in Boston now that it's over, but this is what they signed up for. They knew this coming in, though they're, they're going to get better from whatever happens, they're going to be back and they're going to be better for it. But definitely, you, know, you got the weight of 100 plus years on your, on your shoulders, it, it makes a difference. But there is no curse. When they're the best team and they play the best, they're going to win, they're going to win the thing. You mentioned that you didn't feel, didn't realize the pressure until you left Boston. When you went to, you were in LA, you were in New York. Did you almost exhale going to those markets? I exhaled in 2004, and I wasn't even playing the game anymore. Um, I was sitting down in Miami. My first child was born, and when the when the when the Sox came back and swept the Yankees, I think all of us any all of us Sox players with any time of service felt a sigh of, of relief. And when they finally you know beat the beat the uh, St. Louis in four, you know all the years came off, all the struggles, all the the, the, the media, all the fans, all the booze, all that came off at that one time. So I understand what it is. You, you mentioned feel that, it. that 2004 team, uh, the man who led that team, Terry Francona, is at it again. He's in Cleveland, got the uh, Indians one way away from going to the World Series, and he's done it unorthodox, uh, outside the box, especially with his bullpen. As a hitter, how tough is it to face what he's doing? He's bringing in guys. You're basically facing a different pitcher every time you come to the plate. That's what experience is. You know, Pitch, you know, pitch, getting guys out is unpredictability. Um, and he's now switched the roles of when certain guys are going to be in the ballgame. So nobody knows who's warming up and why. Listen, the, the, you know, the Indians, they're, they're catching the baseball, they're making the plays, they're getting the timely hitting, okay? And he's pinpointing when to use that bullpen at the right times. And right now he's, he's in a very good flow. They got a good chance to win the whole thing. When you look at the talent in Major League Baseball, there's so many young talented arms that just throw so hard. I they mean, got it, on my 92, game. 93 doesn't matter anymore. It's 95, 6, and 7. You were a guy you mentioned. You loved crowding the plate back then. If you were in this day and age against these guys, would it have changed your approach at the plate? 
listen, I don't know if it'll change my approach, but I'm glad I re I re I'm retired, you know. I, I heard a stat that's like 15 guys throwing 100 plus in the big leagues now when I played there was only one or two. So I'm right where I need to be, sitting in this chair. <laughs> you're sitting in this chair and you're looking good, Mo. Tell us about this I'll new venture you got going on here. Listen, I've, uh, I have I uh, started this clo you know, clothing line, MVP Collections, um, and I started because I was the customer. I was the one going out looking for the 2X, 3X, you know, talls, uh, with on shirts, with on pants. And there just wasn't anything, anything to find. Um, and I figured that why not go out and try to give the style? Why can't they look like you and I every day, the, big, the bigger guy, the taller guy? Why can't they have the same style as anybody else has? So this is how this whole thing came, came about. Um, and it's, it's, it's me understanding, you know, what it is because I was, I was searching for it. And then we put this thing, we've been on e -com, you know, nine weeks. You know, we're only, only, only on e -com right now. We will try to get, you know, get into a stand, you know, get into the stores. But, you know, with the social media, and you know, I'm older. So I'm learning about this whole social <laughs> media thing. But with that, that's how we're learning about the customer. We need people to, 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 to let us know. You know, on Instagram, on, on Twitter, uh, at Mo Vaughn underscore 42, on MVP Collections, at uh, um, Mo Vaughn underscore USA. Let us know how you feel. We got to figure out what's going on with the line. We need everybody's information to figure out that, that out so we can pinpoint what we need to make the line grow and be as good as possible. You're too kind to throw me into that group of uh, big guys that look good. <laughs> but I like it, Mo. Thank you, man. You mentioned social media. You just joined. Right, the last couple weeks. Joined, What's joined that like, been like for you, reconnecting with so many fans that listen, you know have been looking for you over um, the years? I don't know if anybody's looking for me. Um, I'm pretty much of a private person, but I I understand that you need to to take the good, the bad, the criticisms, how we can constructive criticism, how we can affect things, how people can affect us to make us better. That's what it's there for, and you can't be afraid of that. So that's uh, how we're going to use it. It's very very important for everybody. Again. To, to let us know let us know what's going on let us know how you feel what changes can we can make to make it better and we'll try to do that you can't hide now you're looking too good in the MVP collection man <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> great to see you thanks for coming in Mo. all right appreciate thanks a lot it. appreciate it all right now to basketball where the biggest storyline heading into the NBA season is the super team assembled in Golden State but what about the team and more importantly the teammate Kevin Durant left behind in Oklahoma City SI senior writer Lee Jenkins has this week's cover story on Russell Westbrook, who without Durant will begin a brand new era in OKC this season. Here's a preview. On August 4th, Russell Westbrook signed a three-year, $86 million contract extension to stay in Oklahoma City, a move that surprised a lot of people, except the ones who actually know him. Yes, Westbrook is from Los Angeles. Yes, he likes fashion. Yes, Kevin Durant left for Golden State, and yes, the path to a championship in OKC grew murky. But the decision for Westbrook, a creature of routine, slow to trust and low to change, was fairly simple. He didn't stay because he wanted to needle Durant or wear the white hat after years of wearing black. He stayed because, in addition to the obvious financial incentives, Oklahoma City is where he has played a lot of exceptional basketball. It's where he reached the NBA Finals and where he became an MVP candidate. Not bad for a high school afterthought who had to scrap for a college scholarship. Championship or not, OKC worked for Westbrook, and he maintains it can work still. Obviously, the dynamic is different. The ball, always in his hands before, doesn't have to leave anymore, begging the question, what will he do with it? Pound it or move it? Drive it or kick it? Savor the solo act or find a co-star? He can't know yet but he believes he's in the right spot to discover his new formula. Wow, great stuff. Westbrook continues to show he is a lot different than many of us thought he was. And let's bring in SI senior writer Lee Jenkins, who had the cover story in this week's Sports Illustrated. And Lee, while all eyes will be on Durant and the Warriors, SI placed Russell Westbrook on the cover of their NBA preview. What did you learn about him while doing this story? Well, I think the, the biggest takeaway I had from it is just, you know, it's just kind of how much he's able to appreciate what's happened for him in the last eight years. And I think some players, when they don't win a championship, there's a, there's a tendency um, to think about everything that's gone wrong. 
And we somebody like Westbrook, who had to scrap for a college scholarship, didn't even know he'd get one until spring of his senior year, you know, who wasn't necessarily um, a safe draft pick coming out of UCLA. I think he's probably able to look back at the last eight years and think, you know, things have gone pretty well. There have been a lot of, you know, a lot of things that he's been able to accomplish individually. They've been in the mix as a team. And I think that that separates him in some ways, um, his ability to sort of reflect and analyze kind of the benefits and the advantages he had from that culture, that community. Um, and I think that, you know, his ability to, to kind of dig deep into what's being gained there really informed his decision to resign. You talk about the last eight years. It was always portrayed that KD was the hero, the sweetest candy superstar, while Westbrook was the egomaniac with reckless behavior on the court and that eccentric style off it. Clearly, those roles seem to have been reversed here. As Durant has been vilified by joining the Warriors, is there a part of you that think Russell is maybe enjoying a little bit of this? No, I don't really think he cares about that stuff. I think he's become pretty numb to it over the years. I think early on, you know, talking to people who know him well, I think early on it, it probably did get to him a little bit, um, some of those sort of easy characterizations. Um, but I don't. I think now at this point he's sort of seen both sides of that coin, and I don't think he necessarily puts much stock in either one. Um, but I will say this, you know, if you looked at his face the day he resigned and they took him into the arena for the press conference and all the fans were out there and they were bat banging on the windows and, you know, I, he did he did light up. So I'm sure that as much as everybody says, as much as players always say they don't care, I think there is something inside them that, that does care, although he would certainly never betray that. Now, in the story, Lee, you make the comparison between the Thunder and the 2001 Sixers, a team that was a one-man show led by Allen Iverson, went all the way to the NBA Finals. Does Westbrook think that type of run is possible with this team, or does he have to get more players involved to be successful? You know, in this day and age, I think a team like that would be it would be hard pressed to to make a real run. You know, there's so much dependency now on shooting, on spacing the floor, and he's going to need he's going to need space to operate. Uh, I mean, it's just a different game now than it was then. I think I think that they actually do have a lot in common with that team. Their ability to to offensive rebound, um, some of the defensive strength they put around him, but he's going to need to elevate the group. And I mean, really, I think it's going to take time for him to find what that right balance is. And there will be nights and stretches where he does go into takeover mode, and that'll be really fun to watch. And it might be the best course of action for the Thunder in a lot of circumstances. But as far as the long view. He has to develop another co-star. He has to develop someone else out of that team, maybe Victor Oladipo, another guy who can take the onus off him because it's too much. What he did in 14-15 when Durant was out, he was kind of lighting the league on fire. I don't know that that's sustainable over 82 games. He's going to need he's going to need to elevate the group, and then he's also going to need to show that Oklahoma City is a place where another potential star would want to come, would want to sign a free agency if they're going to have a, a realistic chance of getting back into title contention. You mentioned he'll need the time to figure that out. He's going to get the time. As many thought Westbrook would just bide his time until 2017 and then bolt for free agency. Instead, he signs that three-year, $86 million deal to stay in OKC. Uh, how important was it for the league to have Westbrook stay instead of jumping ship and you know following suit like some of the other guys and pairing up with other uh, superstars around the league? Well, it depends. It depends on where you fall in the super team argument. You know, there are people who believe the super teams are a good thing for the NBA. I think as far as international appeal, um, the super teams really resonate. I think the super teams create, you know, they create villains and heroes and all of that. So I think in one, in one, you know, there's one way of looking at it that is that the super teams are, are healthy for the league. But if you believe, if you want to see more contenders spread across the NBA, um, then you would say that it's healthier for him to stay. To me, you know, I feel like Oklahoma City is a pretty special market, and the the scene inside their games is different, really, than than pretty much any other NBA arena. Um, that following has been really strong. They've occupied kind of a special place in the NBA landscape, and if Westbrook had left. Clearly, they are going back to ground zero. They are. Uh, they would have to build up from the studs. And so the fact that he returns, it, it keeps Oklahoma City relevant. And in some ways, it keeps this Durant-Westbrook dynamic alive. 
Yeah, it will certainly be alive when they face each other for the first time. Uh, let's talk about a couple other teams. The NBA GM survey came out yesterday, and 100% of those who took the poll are expecting either the Warriors or the Cavs to win the title. With, with such heavy odds and such a top-heavy league, uh, what else is there that we should be paying attention to this year in the NBA? No, you're right. It's, it's a weird league right now because the middle class is deep um, and there's not a lot at the top and really there's not too much at the bottom either. There aren't a lot of teams tanking anymore. Um, you're, not, you're not seeing that the way you did a year or two ago. Uh, so, I mean, I think the question is going to be, will one of those middle class teams come up and challenge? I personally think that team will be the Clippers um, that could come up and become you know, sort of the, the the surefire number two seed in the West, um, and and poten you know potentially challenge Golden State, although that's clearly going to be difficult. And can there be a team like that out east? You know, a team like Boston. Um, if, I, if I were picking one, a, a team that could come up. You know, Toronto's still there, of course, um, but Boston with the biggest improvement with Al Horford. But I think a lot of this season is going to be uh, the interest in it will be based on the individuals and a guy like Westbrook and, and how captivating he'll be, the kind of numbers that he's going to put up. James Harden's in the same boat, you know, somebody who's going to put up just ridiculous stat lines throughout the season. And I think, I think a lot of the enjoyment people have in the NBA this year will be based on the stars potentially more than the teams. You mentioned the individuals. LeBron is the favorite to win the MVP, which would be his fifth. Quickly, Lee, give us a dark horse, someone you think is poised to have a huge season that, that could possibly steal the MVP from LeBron. You, you know, I, I think LeBron, I think LeBron, some votes for LeBron may get siphoned off just by Kyrie Irving and his emergence, because I actually think he's an MVP candidate too. So you have a situation in Cleveland and Golden State, and it's kind of comes with the super team dynamic where the voting could be cannibalized in both cases with Curry and Durant, with LeBron and Irving. My pick for MVP is actually Harden. And it's it's I think that Harden and Westbrook are going to put up ridiculous stats. I think that that Hardens are going to be really otherworldly. Now look usually you don't get an MVP from a team that finishes outside the top two or three, let's say in a conference. So Houston has its work cut out for it. But I do think that um, I do think the numbers are going to be pretty eye-popping. He's had big numbers already, James Harden, but with a D'Antoni system, he's going to be basically the full-time point mm -hmm. guard. I think you're going to see some ridiculous stuff this year out of James Harden. All right, the Russell Westbrook story is part of SI's NBA preview. You can read that in the magazine and NSI.com. Lee Jenkins, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, before there was Tiger and Phil in the world of golf, the most popular figure on the PGA Tour was the Great White Shark. Greg Norman won more than 90 tournaments over his career, including two major championships. But unlike many golfers who hit the senior circuit and try to keep playing late in their career, Norman has veered away from the game. Earlier today, I caught up with the man who is arguably the greatest athlete turned businessman in sports history. All right, Greg, you're uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of your company, which has uh, gotten into a lot of new ventures, but also going through quite the transformation. Mm -hmm. Great White Shark Enterprises has now been rebranded the Greg Norman Company. Uh, tell us about that and the thinking behind the rebrand. Well, Great White Shark Enterprises was founded in two, 1992, 93, that, that era. But the logo before it was started um, with Reebok with the Greg Norman Collection. So the 30-year cycle really represents that. But when Great White Shark Enterprises was in play, I was, it was a sport, sports marketing company. Why? Because obviously I was still playing golf. I was number one player in the world. I was doing a, you know, a global trip, you know, promoting the game of golf. So I got that, right? Um, but during the time, we had established a, a lot of really good businesses um, by being completely vertically integrated with the game of golf. So we created this massive platform of um, credibility and sustainability about what we've been doing. Um, more in the consumer product side of things, whether it was clothing like Greg Norman Collection or the wine like Greg Norman Wines and the beef and the eyewear. Um, but we built that out into real estate as well. So we thought about getting to an agency and talking about rebranding the company. Right. So we went to NSG SWAT and all of a sudden 14 months of hard work internally and externally here we are with the, the new company, the Greg Norman Company. Exciting times, exciting uh, days ahead for you, mm -hmm. I know. Uh, interesting enough, got to ask you, in the news in the last week now, 
Tiger Woods announced a, a rebrand as well, yeah. coming on the heels of his withdrawal from the Safeway Open. Mm -hmm. um, a very surprising withdrawal from Tiger. We thought this was the time we were going to see him. What do you think? What's your take on Tiger? What's going on with him? Oh, look, I don't know. I don't speak to the guy. I can only read what I read. Uh, you know, assumptions are, you know, opinions like everybody. Everybody's got one. But at the end of the day, he probably realizes that uh, maybe his career is coming to an end, you know, playing-wise. He has to keep established in some way. And... Um, uh, Imitation is the best form of flattery to some degree. So I look at what he's doing. Um, is something what I did with my predecessors, like Jack and Arnold, um, Tom Watson to a degree, Ray, Raymond Floyd, Lee Trevino, what they did with their brands and positioning. So I studied them to make sure that I went off in a different direction or, or took some components of what they did and made sure that that was successful for my business. I want to ask you quickly, uh about we talk about changes we talk about the future quite a bit here some changes coming to the PGA Tour mm -hmm. uh, change in leadership Tim Fincham retiring it looks like Jay Monahan will be the man to take over as commissioner for someone who's played in the game during a few different eras do you think there is a need does the PGA Tour need to change their ways when it comes to drug testing and get up to speed with say the NFL Major League Baseball the NBA and other you know international sports oh absolutely the, the, I think they should be hundred percent transparent and I'll give you an example I was going into the British Open and St. Andrews of the year, Fowler beat me. Um, and there was a lot of speculation back then that guys were on beta blockers and stuff like this to calm themselves down under pressure. And I was number one player in the world. I went to the RNA and I said, why don't we nip this in the bud? Why don't I be the first? I'll give a urine sample and let's just prove to the world that we are clean or we do have this problem in there. Now, remember, in golf... There wasn't any rules to say you couldn't take perform performance-enhancing drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at um, what's happened in the Olympics um, and other sports that you just mentioned, um, you, you look at the, the irritation of what, especially the Tour de France, right? I would be so upset, right, if you knew you were out there competing in my era and guys were beating you because they had an outside substance to make them better than you, uh, because to me, sport is all about how physically demanding and mentally tough you can be. It's easy to go fire something down your system to help you do whatever you want to do, but that's not the reality of life. And um, transparency is the most important thing because you do not want to have a legacy in a sport where the younger ch kids look at it and say, well, it was okay for them to do it, why don't I do it? You've got to clean it up at the grassroots level. Um, the biometric passport would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. Have kids start at high school, and that passport goes with them through college and goes through them with the professional ranks. And as they get older, then you show that the sport is totally clean. And I would hate this. Everybody speculates there's an 800-pound gorilla in the room of the PGA Tour. Get rid of it. It's very easy to get rid of it. If that person did it, you're off. Yeah. Lifetime ban. No, no tolerance. Zero tolerance. And uh, you're done. Um, so to me, it, you know, looking into it, I would hope the PGA Tour um, starts looking at it and follows what the, the IOC has implemented. You mentioned the Times on ahead for the tour. Exciting times ahead for you, Greg, and the Greg Norman Company. Mm -hmm. Wish you the best of luck with the rebrand. And we'll be watching you down the road. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yeah, appreciate it. That's going to do it for this Wednesday edition of SI Now. We're going to be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern when Chris Ballard will talk with new Golden State Warrior Kevin Durant. We'll share more from Maggie's conversation with Carly Lloyd. Until then, you can keep up with all the latest news on SI.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Have a great afternoon. Last season, Steph Curry became the first unanimous MVP in NBA history and won the award for a second straight season. But the NBA GMs believe a 3 p